It's the Autosport Podcast. We're looking back at the Singapore Grand Prix and Nico Rosberg's great victory from a charging Daniel Ricciardo. And we ask just what happened to Lewis Hamilton. Well, what a race that was. Daniel Ricciardo falling short of overhauling Nico Rosberg by just 0.488 seconds in a dramatic end to the race. I'm joined by Autosports Grand Prix editor Ben Anderson, who gave both drivers the perfect 10 in his ever controversial driver ratings. Yes, indeed, I did. Thank you, Ed. Um, Both drivers fantastic at the weekend. Uh, Impossible to split, really, on their performances. Deserving of a perfect 10, I think. And as always, from some of the reader criticism and feedback on that, your ratings, of course, are wrong. It's not just Ben. We've also got Autosport Features editor Scott Mitchell, who's taking time out of his, his usual Formula E beat to revel in the noise of V6 turbo hybrids. How did, how did you find the noise? Uh, surprising. Uh, not quite as surprising as getting halfway through the race and uh, drivers not heading straight for the pits to jump into a completely different car. I thought that might be going for a controversial first lap strategy when they all came into the pits at the end of the first lap. But obviously, that was necessitated by the debris on the start finish straight after the crash. I can see why it might have been a little bit disorientating. Well, for the record, my name is Ed Straw, the editor-in-chief of Autosport. Obviously, we came very close to a last lap lead change for the second time this season, which wouldn't have been bad. So, Rosberg versus Ricardo. Ben, how did, how did you see that race? The race was pretty quiet, I think, for the most part, um, with the strategies playing out equally. Rosberg kind of had Ricardo covered. They were on the same tyre for kind of just after half distance, and you thought, well... This race is done. Ricardo was close, but you couldn't really see him having a go at Rosberg, even with the brake management that Rosberg was having to do in the Mercedes. And then really a chain reaction of strategy changes triggered actually by Lewis Hamilton falling behind Kimi Räikkönen set off the last part of the race. And you suddenly had the two leading cars on different strategies and Ricardo coming at Rosberg on fresher tries, trying to hunt him down. And it really brought the race to life. And it certainly seemed to be that outlap that Ricardo pulled out of the bag. Toto Wolff was certainly surprised by it and because they were planning to bring Rosberg in. But the two fastest sector times in sector two and three of the whole race from Ricardo there. So I guess that was that was a game changer, wasn't it? The, the, the undercut was powerful, but that was a brilliantly executed one, wasn't it? The undercut is always really powerful in Singapore. And yeah, Ricardo doing it when it counts, really, almost Schumacher-esque in his ability to turn out the sectors exactly when needed. Combination of his pace and also Rosberg encountering some traffic. I think he was lapping Felipe Nazar's Sauber on that lap. Uh, Mercedes calculating that it was going to be tight if they brought Rosberg in to cover Ricardo's strategic move and decided, well, actually, we'll, we'll gamble on having enough of a gap and enough of a handle on the, the brake management issues to hold him off to the end. And ultimately, it just about worked out for them. I think you could see as well from when, uh, when Ricardo rejoined just how close he actually was in terms of having... Raikkonen and Hamilton behind him that you could visibly see that they'd closed up massively on their undercut so I think the second Ricardo exited the pits you sort of felt that there was no way Rosberg was going to be able to stop and then you, that from then on it was actually quite a the conclusion was quite tantalizing really yeah it's just a shame I guess it didn't quite quite play out as everyone would have hoped with a side-by-side battle it was actually pretty measured from Mercedes because while the gap at the end just under half a second I guess, looks looks incredibly close. Rosberg was clear at the start of that final lap, so he was always safe in the DRS zone. So I guess you could argue that that was a little bit less tight than maybe it looked. Well, actually, to start with in that final stint, Ros- uh, Ricciardo had 13 laps, I think, to, to bring down the deficit, and he needed to lap, uh, I calculated, two seconds a lap faster than Rosberg to, to haul him in. And to begin with... He set a sequence of roughly half a dozen laps that were more than that quicker than Rosberg. And you thought, well, actually, if he keeps this up, this race is on. And that was really impressive. And you thought, well, you know, Rosberg clearly has some problems with the car. This is really on. But Mercedes were managing the situation. Toto Wolff said they were trying to store up what battery life they had, what brakes they had left to use at the end, should Ricardo get close enough. And also there was a, a period of encountering traffic, Rosberg... Uh, lapping the tail end of the top 10 or just outside the top 10 Massa Gutierrez Ricardo found that same traffic 
and that kind of halted his charge a little bit and also took a lot from his tyres and he never really got the pace back after that. He was still quicker and hauling Rosberg in, but not quite at the same rate as before. It was down to sort of one, one and a half seconds per lap and ultimately he fell short. The last lap, Rosberg, I think, knew Ricardo was there and was just trying to get to the end in a Fangio-esque slowest possible speed. And I guess that's the the essence of why they both got 10s, isn't it? Rosberg drove stunningly well. Obviously, his qualifying margin was enormous, really stunning qualifying lap. And, it, and it's easy kind of to put the focus on Ricardo because he was cast as the charger thanks to the the tyre advantage. So it's kind of thing you just think, oh, it's just, you know, one guy charging, the other one just hanging on. But that, I guess, was the the kind of two strategies meeting in the middle, wasn't it? At the end of the race with, with Rosberg just trying to eke out, I think it was like 28 laps on soft in that final stint. So that was, that was no mean feat. And to judge it so well, it's just outstanding. It's exactly what you want, isn't it? Two, two fantastically good drivers really going at it and then coming together right at the end of the race. Yeah, Rosberg really came into his own this weekend, I think. Um, it's been a, a strange season from his point of view. Obviously he had that run very early on, four wins on the bounce, Hamilton with all of his engine problems and reliability concerns and a big points lead for Rosberg and then Hamilton's kind of chipped away at that and Rosberg really has seemed on the back foot going into the summer break but since the summer break his form has kind of gradually improved he was demolished in qualifying at Monza by Hamilton but turned it around in the race and then his qualifying in Singapore was outstanding I'd say probably his best performance of the season certainly the best performance I've seen him given any qualifying session in Formula One, and that really set him up for Sunday afternoon or Sunday night in this case. I guess the question is can he sustain it? We've got six races left. He's leading the championship, so you know the, the chance is there. He's got the best car. There's not going to be anybody else regularly being an interloper, so it's just toe to toe him and Hamilton, isn't it? We've seen before Rosberg in this situation. Last season didn't really go that way, but 2014. We had that run of races going towards the end of the season where Rosberg got into winning positions and then often through his own mistake squandered them. You know, mistakes Monza, Sochi, Austin, there were multiple races. So that's the question, isn't it? Is Rosberg really going to make a race of this? Because since the August break, it's really looking like he is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the August break, since then, well, Hamilton had his tactical engine penalty in Spa. So we didn't have a really a straight fight there and he had that, outstanding recovery to to the podium a lot to do with luck but he drove well and Rosberg was surprised to see his teammate on the podium at that race and he thought well this should be the race where Hamilton takes the biggest hit and he's kind of got away with it and yet goes we go to Monza Hamilton on pole by miles and you think well this is kind of normal service resumed but he he fluffed the start and victory to Rosberg only a, a second place for Hamilton and you think well okay maybe this is on Singapore, Hamilton was really all at sea. Um, he struggled in Baku, I remember, which I, I would say is a similar kind of circuit to Singapore. Obviously, the straight is longer in Baku, but it's one of those sort of expansive street circuits with some difficult braking zones. And Hamilton really struggled there, uh, particularly in qualifying. And that kind of set Rosberg up for his, until Singapore, his strongest weekend of the season. And we kind of saw a similar story in Singapore, Hamilton this time in practice, not really getting it together, not getting comfortable with the car, not being able to find the setup he wants. And, you know, in a championship fight that's this close, it shows you can't really afford to, to leave any stone unturned or really have anything kind of derail you because the other guy is waiting to pounce. Hamilton's renowned as a fantastic driver un under braking. He seemed incapable of actually getting it under control when he needed it. And I just wonder whether or not that combined with what we heard him saying during the race about not being able to sort of react, not being able to actually pull anything out of the bag. He didn't have anything until he had that little carrot at the end where all of a sudden there's a little bit of a change, go for third against Raikkonen. Then we just saw, I don't know, something came together, but it's just weird that we saw that sort of weakness from him in an area that he's usually so strong. I think uh, it's probably harsh to declare it a weakness on Hamilton's part maybe because the brakes were such an issue for Mercedes some were suggesting maybe that was overblown but the fact that Rosberg had to manage them even though he was out front and in clean air the whole time it was only going to be worse for Hamilton having to manage that in dirtier air certainly from the start of the race you could argue maybe Hamilton was less adept at getting on top of that but he said himself once that situation did come under control he was able to then 
attack and drive faster and, and start racing the Ferrari again. So you could say it's partly Hamilton's fault, but also he he was waiting for the car to come back to him, I think. And then once it did, he was able to kind of push on. That did seem to be the wider problem for Hamilton, just of a, a lack of pace as well. Obviously, he was struggling quite a bit in practice. A little bit of time was lost. He did, I think, 17 fewer laps than Rosberg across free practice, 18 fewer laps, in fact. So it just seems to be one of those weekends where he was always on the back foot. And I guess you'd probably say coming away third place in that scenario with Red Bull strong was, was pretty good, especially seeing as how close he was to losing third to, to Raikkonen and having been passed before that final stop. Yeah, you can look at it either way, I think. If you're taking the optimistic glass half full approach, which you just have, he'll look at that as a podium saved. But really, even in, in a difficult weekend, he should be finishing second to Rosberg. Or, the, or at least in the hunt for second, which he wasn't really at no point in that race. Was he in that battle for the top two places? That that's the surprise that you know he was eight seconds back from Rosberg at the finish, and that was that was fairly fairly representative, really. Well, absolutely, he he should have been pushing Ricardo to to race for second, even if he didn't get there. And he was never in that fight. He was always defending from Raikkonen, really, and then in the end, fighting a different fight further back. Singapore is a confidence circuit. Jensen Button was talking about that on Saturday night. How you need the car to evolve with you. He was nowhere all the way through practice in the McLaren Honda and then he managed to get some setup tweaks ready for qualifying and till he brushed the wall, he was within half a tenth of Fernando Alonso. So it can turn around very quickly, but Hamilton never really found that groove with his car. Rosberg slotted in. Every lap he did seem clean. He had no mistakes. He was just able to build and build and build, evolve the setup, get more confidence, extract the lap time as the track evolved. Whereas Hamilton, he kind of lost his way, delayed by that leak on Friday in the second session, Saturday morning, he had a problem with the suspension, I believe. That set him back just when he needed to make up the track time he'd lost the previous day. And you go into qualifying in that situation, you, you, it's guesswork really as to you know extracting that last bit of performance from the car. And when your teammate's on the form that Rosberg was in, and Hamilton's had such a tricky build-up, there's not really much he can do, I don't think, e- even given how good he is. But in terms of what Hamilton himself was saying, you know, he said after the race made comments about the fact that he feels like he's been actually on the back foot all season. But actually, after Friday's running, when he lost his time, you know, he was playing down the potential disadvantage of that, saying as long as we've got one car running, racking up the mileage, we can get, we can do the setup work, we can do this and that, which is all fine during the weekend. And then the weekend ends, he loses out, you know, as you pointed out, finished third as well. So the points lost is even greater than it arguably should have been on an off day for him. So, you know, where where's his head actually at? Does he genuinely believe that you know, this isn't a major setback or is he starting to feel the pressure? I mean, Singapore seems to be the best example yet that he actually does have a proper fight for the title in terms of the running this season. You know, Rosberg's done well the previous two years in terms of winning races throughout the year, but they have tailed off both times. You know, does Ham- does it look like Hamilton's actually feeling that Rosberg is a serious threat for the rest of the season? interesting comment Hamilton made during the weekend when you said words to the effect of I've been on the back foot all season he's right in so far as some mechanical problems early on cost him points and then he was always going to have to do that uh, that engine flurry of engine component changes at Spa but he kind of got through that and he he got past that position ahead in the points which was a, which was a win and actually in many ways you've then got a slight advantage because he had they had plenty of fresh um, power unit components etc so you almost feel like he shouldn't feel like he was on the back foot at that point, but there's still almost that kind of strange mindset of, well, things are still going against me, when actually he should be thinking, right, straight fight, I'm better than Nico, I've been better than Nico the last two years, I, sh- I should be able to do this. Well, listening to Hamilton talk after the race on Sunday night, he sounded quite curt in his responses to journalist questions. And that's not uncommon for Hamilton, especially when he's had a bad weekend, but he didn't sound overly perturbed by the events of Singapore, you have to get some perspective if you're in Hamilton's situation. Like you say, he's been better than Nico in the same car for the last two and a half seasons consistently. So he has to fall back on that that self-belief, really. Rosberg had an unbelievably strong weekend in Singapore. And we know Rosberg is capable of those weekends, but usually those weekends come when he gets absolutely everything right, nothing goes wrong for him, and... Hamilton also suffers some kind of setback or has something that derails him along the way. In a straight fight, you'd have to always back Hamilton. And I think Hamilton would also back himself in that situation. Also, Hamilton's normally the one who, if things do, do start to go awry, 
usually he's got a bit more about him in terms of pulling it back. I mean, the German Grand Prix with Rosberg was a classic example, wasn't it? As soon as he made a bad start, the, the, week, the weekend just went from bad to, bad to worse for him. Yeah, that's the thing. Rosberg doesn't have the same powers of recovery that Hamilton has and has shown us many times. He's more likely to get stuck behind another car, more likely to make a mistake, go off the road, just not quite having that absolute judgment under stress when things are going wrong. But when things are smooth and clean, Rosberg can absolutely deliver. What we don't know yet is in the running whether he can keep delivering as the pressure for the championship ramps up. Hamilton's been in that situation many times, knows exactly how to to handle himself. If Rosberg finds himself again in a shootout, it's can I actually deliver when it absolutely matters and everything's on the line? And history goes against him there. Yeah, it does. Yeah, um, you know, 2014, he had a chance in Abu Dhabi, got pole for the last race, double points, fluffed the start, then his car let him down, and that his best chance to be what Formula One world champion until this point went up in smoke, almost literally. So he's heading towards the possibility that he might have another chance to to go for it. He's won eight races now, and history shows that no driver who's won that many races in a season hasn't gone on to take the title. So that's a, a a good sign for Rosberg, but Omens aren't going to win him the World Championship. Only he's going to be able to do that. It's going to be interesting, actually, to see how the next few races go because, obviously, we've got the out-of-position Malaysian Grand Prix in terms of, obviously, where it's been on the calendar previously. But after that, we go to places where, I believe, Hamilton has won the last two years. So there, we will see whether or not that, you know, I don't know whether these drivers or, or, or you guys really believe in sort of favoured venues or, you know, it's like a football team that has, or a striker that has particular football teams he scores goals goals against. I suspect actually in this scenario, there's more relevance to the fact that drivers click with certain circuits. But if Rosberg, you know, can go through the Malaysian Grand Prix weekend and still be in front in the points and then go to those venues where Hamilton's actually been on top of him the last two years in terms of race results... I guess that will be, you know, a great tonic for him going into what will then be the final three races of the season. You know, we know he's strong, you know, we know he's strong in Mexico and Brazil and in Abu Dhabi. You know, if he can get through those two events where Hamilton has previously had the edge, surely he's going to have as much confidence as Hamilton in terms of being able to bring it home. Well, it certainly sets it up interestingly. I think there's always been the feeling that the ball's kind of in Hamilton's court. He's he's eight points behind now, but you still feel that kind of on a on a normal weekend he has that slight edge, but there's enough to to make it interesting. Are we not do, are we not doing a like Rosberg a, a massive disservice in terms of you know giving Hamilton the the benefit of the doubt in terms of their title battle? Because I know that obviously for a lot of this season there there maybe has been this air of uh, Rosberg might be edging towards the title, but he's not really sort of been outstanding or astonishing at any point. Even at the start of the season, you mentioned that run he went on, he had. Uh, Hamilton had you know a litany of problems and even when Hamilton went from being what was it 40 odd points adrift to then 19 points in front Rosberg's turned that round now but he, that's still come at the at the result of Hamilton having a few problems like you know the grid drop in Spa and the you know the issues that he's had over the Singapore weekend you know do do we think that because of Rosberg's reputation and Hamilton's reputation we then downplay the significance of actually what Rosberg's done Singapore the Singapore was genuinely impressive i think probably the first time this season he's been you know absolutely outstanding i think it was the weekend of a world champion well i'd say it was probably the second weekend he's been like that Sing- singapore and baku are the two weekends that just stand out in rosberg season the two weekends where you look at his performance and go well actually i can't really fault that but you could say in each case he hasn't really been challenged his main challenger has derailed himself or been derailed by car problems and that lets Rosberg off the hook what we've seen time and again when it's 1v1 Hamilton versus Rosberg Hamilton is usually the one who comes out on top and Rosberg can't really look at any races this year and say I beat Hamilton I overtook him on track to win the race there's always something that's gone wrong for Hamilton he's messed a start up there's been some kind of problem early in the weekend, which means he's on the back foot and trying to recover. So I don't know if we're really doing Rosberg a disservice. He's a, obviously a fantastic Grand Prix driver, but the whole body of evidence that we have over the last two and a half years suggests that he isn't quite at the same level, all things being equal, as Lewis Hamilton. I think there's also the the problem of 
Rosberg on his best weekends isn't really a problem. Yeah, that was the weekend of a world champion, but it's the it's when things start to go wrong and unravel. You know, there's six races to go. Rosberg's going to have some adversity. They both will. You know, these things these things do tend to even themselves out actually. And there will be times where Rosberg needs to claw back a difficult situation. There's the old saying about you win championships on your on your bad days. Hmm is often true because if you think about it, everybody's best day is going to be a win and 25 points. Whereas, you know, if there's a race where you could recover to fifth and one of them recovers to fifth and the other one doesn't, then that's that's a 10-point difference you suddenly picked up there. That's an extreme example, but it, that will be the thing that, that decides it. Yeah, we had a good example of that earlier in the season. If you remember the Canadian Grand Prix, Hamilton and Rosberg went side by side into turn one, a little bit of contact, delayed both of them, Obviously, Rosberg more than Hamilton. Hamilton wins the race. Rosberg's got to mount a recovery drive. He ends up getting stuck behind Max Verstappen's Red Bull, doesn't finish on the podium. You'd feel that if roles had been reversed in that race, Hamilton would have got past Max Verstappen's Red Bull. He would have scored more points than Rosberg. We never really see Rosberg dig out a result when things are going against him. You mentioned the, the circuits earlier, the circuits where one might be stronger than the other. Hamilton has mentioned in the past Rosberg's particularly strong at places like Bahrain. And I think if you look at the the run of circuits we've got to the end of the season, Rosberg will look at those and say, well, I've been on pole, I think, at all of them except Malaysia. and But that means nothing because he's been on pole at those races and not won the races because Hamilton's found a way to overcome that disadvantage. And you just feel that if roles are reversed, Rosberg isn't going to find that way to win. And... I guess we'll see if he's learned his lesson or not in the coming races. What's interesting about that as well is, you know, Singapore Grand Prix victory was Rosberg's 22nd of his career, which is an astonishing win tally for someone who, you know, there's a very realistic chance that he'll never win the title. And I guess a bit of an unfair twist on him, given his uh, father was very good at winning a world championship, despite actually not winning he won one race that season and I think, what, two other races in his in the rest yes, of his uh, career. F- five in total, five in world total. championship races, yeah. Which, which is not, which is dwarfed by the, the 22 that, that Nico's now got. Uh, of course, we also had the Ferraris in the game. Kimi Raikkonen, Sebastian Vettel, fourth and fifth. Obviously, Vettel was recovering. Raikkonen, at one stage, looked set for third before that strategic gambit by Hamilton and Mercedes. Raikkonen actually having a, a pretty strong weekend there. Yeah, I'd say that was Raikkonen's best weekend of the season. He's been driving a lot better since Ferrari announced that he'd be staying on for another season they announced his contract extension in July at the British Grand Prix and uh, Maurizio Riva Bene the team principal said they did that partly to take the pressure away from Raikkonen to avoid him having to answer endless repeated questions about his future and he has been driving a lot better Um, not really stringing the weekends together but in Singapore I would say he did the only slight letdown was Q3 after his first run, he was quicker than the Red Bulls. So you'd had him on for maybe challenging for the front row, certainly for being on row two. But this happens often with Raikkonen when it comes to the absolute last moment in qualifying. He just stretches a little bit too far, just overreaches, and he ended up qualifying behind the Red Bulls, which defined his race to a certain extent. Is there a way he could have held on to that podium position? Obviously, Hamilton stopped on lap 45. Raikkonen was brought in the next lap in reaction to it. Um, there seemed to be a little bit of a moment of uncertainty amid Ferrari from the radio transmissions we heard, but was it just the pit stop being slightly longer that cost him ultimately? Is there, is there any evidence that Kimi could have been any quicker on the on the in-lap, for example? I think, ultimately, the best way Ferrari could have defended against Hamilton was to do nothing. If they'd left Raikkonen out on the set of tyres he was on before that stop and just tried to get to the end in the same way that Mercedes ultimately were forced to do with Rosberg he would have had a better chance of finishing on the podium. If you look at his lap times, the two laps previous compared to Hamilton, they did identical sectors to their previous laps. So it wasn't as if Hamilton suddenly turned the screw ahead of his pit stop. It wasn't as if Raikkonen fell asleep as Hamilton did his in-lap. The pit stop time was slightly slower from Ferrari, six tenths, so that might have made a difference in the sense that when Raikkonen emerged they might have had a race side by side but I think Ferrari weren't aiming for that situation they were aiming to get in and out of the pits and stay ahead ultimately I think they just made the wrong call in that situation 
It's not the first time, is it, that we've seen Ferrari in a moment where they've got a, a snap decision to make and they've either delayed it or they've made the decision in time, but they've they've made the wrong call. I mean, going right back to the start of the season, obviously the Australian Grand Prix had a great great chance, great chance to win there. Um, and, you know, if, and you look at Raikkonen's teammate Vettel, you know, it was a very well executed race. You know, they had the, the strategy right in terms of going longer in in, in the beginning on the on the soft tire. But that's a very easy, very safe thing to do because, you know, Vettel at the, at the time starting at the back, he's not racing anything. Actually, in the heat of the moment where you say, as you said, you know, it's the safe option and the sense and the sensible option really is to, to leave Raikkonen out on track and, and and fight for position. But they've just, in the heat of the moment, they, they've made the wrong call again. Yeah, we've seen it before from Ferrari. Um, my golden rule with the strategy is always track position is king. And in this situation, by leaving Raikkonen out, they would have maintained track position and asked Mercedes and Hamilton to find a way past. By making the move that they did, they handed the place to him and then put the emphasis on Raikkonen to try and counter-attack behind. And that doesn't really work. We saw in Australia when they had track position over the Mercedes, um, the red flag happened and they had an opportunity then to throw away a set of super soft tyres put on the mandatory harder tyre that they needed to get to the end of the race, but they decided to stick to their original strategy inexplicably, forced themselves to make another pit stop under racing conditions and ended up behind the Mercedes again. And after that race, Ferrari were defending their strategy, saying, well, we picked an aggressive strategy, we had to stick to it. But absolutely not in that instance. What they needed to do was think, we have track position, so we need to protect that track position at all costs and do the best move that protects that track position. I guess the one bit of Ferrari strategic thinking we can't really criticise is the Vettel strategy that got him up to fifth. Now, he got the the official driver of the day award as voted for, which I was slightly surprised by. Obviously, going 22nd to fifth, you know, he executed his race well, but it was a a strategic drive in a car with with a good performance advantage over those behind it. In the end, he was something in the region 40 seconds clear of, of sixth place. So you, there was quite a big envelope for him to aim into, but well worked out strategy by Ferrari. They were patient early on. You know, he spent some time behind NASA early in the race without trying to force the issue too quickly, knowing it would come to him. And, you know, it, it was a good drive, but not not perhaps as great a drive as the uh, as the 22nd to, to fifth numbers might suggest. Yeah, it's one of those that you look on the on the surface, you look at the results and go, well, that's that's great you know 22nd to 5th that's a, it is a, is about the best result that he could have got oh, he could have done no better it's a slightly better result really because he probably would have uh, planned on finishing behind Verstappen but obviously Verstappen had a poor start and uh, was on a fight back drive so was, Vettel was able by executing his own race absolutely cleanly to get ahead of the Red Bull and that's what it was really it was just a clean drive he was off strategy we saw in Spa how starting at the back on the hardest tyre when everyone else is on either two steps or one step softer compound, worked really well for Hamilton and Alonso. Ferrari aped that strategy here, worked really well for Vettel. He drove very sensibly, very intelligently, uh, made sure that he didn't get involved in the the unnecessary midfield battling, which many other drivers failed to do and ultimately compromised their race from doing that. But it wasn't an outstanding Vettel performance. He was a slower Ferrari driver in Singapore. Raikkonen was outperforming him through practice. Vettel was struggling in final practice going into qualifying. So even with without that suspension problem that he had in Q1, I doubt he would have been ahead of Raikkonen when it counted. So a good drive, but you know, he's done better. And so the other thing as well that you, you mentioned there, obviously we know with Vettel starting at the back of the grid, you mentioned uh, Verstappen will spin in his good position on the grid away and then compromising his own race. You know, going back to the Rosberg-Hamilton fight, how fortunate is Lewis that, Ferrari had the issue with Vettel in qualifying and then Verstappen made the mistake he did at the start you know on another day with a better call <clears throat> on another day with a better call for Raikkonen strategy Vettel where he should have been Verstappen not making a mistake how how possible is it that Lewis would have been finishing sixth in that race it would certainly have complicated matters there'd have been more cars littering the area behind Hamilton uh, no question so well, given, given it, the prob- it did make it more straightforward certainly and given the problem he had in terms of managing his brakes, you know, one of the suggestions was the fact, the reason he was afflicted worse than 
Rosberg was the fact that he was in dirty air, whereas Rosberg had the opportunity in clear air to, to manage it a little bit easier. You know, if more cars in front of him, you know, that it just becomes more and more difficult to, to find to find clear space, adapt your strategy to not compromise where you are on track and things like that. I just I just think looking at those looking at the, res- the results, you know, I'm surprised that Verstappen ended up as far behind uh, Vettel as he did, but you just think, you know, small small differences, you know, completely different race. Yeah, well, Verstappen's race was messy. Um, he was doing an outstanding job up to qualifying, but I think he he learned that lesson of Singapore that there's a little bit more to it that meets the eye. And as it gets to the the crunch time, if you like, in qualifying, how you manage the tyre through that whole lap. It's so many corners, it 23 or 24 turns, very hot conditions, very soft tyres. It's very difficult to make them all last through the whole lap it's very difficult to get the preparation right on the outlap and that's something Verstappen struggled with something his teammate Ricardo is very 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 adept at and that just derailed Verstappen I think I think he went into qualifying thinking I've got this I'm going to be the top Red Bull then when he wasn't I think everything just started to, to run away from him a bit and that was his third third bad start in the last three races Christian Horner suggesting that they found a problem with the clutch, but they couldn't prove that there was a problem with the clutch to the FIA, so weren't allowed to change it. Difficult. I bet, bet Nico Hulkenberg's delighted to hear that after <laughs> being put in the pit wall by the uh, the consequence of that slow start. Not through any of Verstappen's fault, but just just one of those things, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Verstappen, Verstappen wheel spun away on the grid. Hulkenberg had an, an amazing start. I think he mm. said it was his best start of the year, and that's difficult to disagree with, but... Fortunately, as he was trying to drive between the two Toro Rossos ahead of him on the grid, they were trying to drive, or certainly Science was trying to drive around Verstappen's car, pincer moment. And That's yeah, a classic and three into two, do not go. Sometimes there are just racing accidents. Yeah, absolutely. And Hulkenberg turned around across the front of Verstappen and uh, Horner said he couldn't believe how Max managed to miss that. It did seem unbelievably close to collecting the the Force India, and that would have been that would have been Verstappen's race over right then. There's some great onboard camera shots of that. We, we enjoyed those ones, and obviously that also created the situation with the early safety car, with the slightly concerning moment of the race when they restarted with a marshal um, who seemed to be still running across the track at, at turn one, which obviously nobody likes to likes to see. <laughs> Soto Wolf rather obviously pointed out it was dangerous. <laughs> um, you know, the FIA said that the, their procedure requires race control to called track clear three times before the restart and it sounded like once they'd done that the track was clear for whatever reason it sounded like the marshal was given an instruction to go onto the track and clear a last bit of debris as the cars were coming around so it got away with it but it it worries me because we've seen these sorts of situations a few times before and if you keep doing it eventually something horrendous happens because we've seen Canada 2011 we had an incident with a marshal he was clearing debris as a car. I think the Sauber was coming round and fell over, and then fell over again while re- while trying to get back up again, which everyone found sort of quite funny. But these situations happening it is not is not amusing with cars travelling at this speed. No, and that's two years in a row in Singapore as well because we had that drunk man on the track last year. Which you wonder sometimes if there's some kind of bet on somewhere to ensure the safety car comes out at the Singapore Grand Prix because last year's race was completely clean, and then suddenly we had a man wandering across the track and they had to throw the safety car this year we had i think a more genuinely unusual incident of uh a marshal was doing his job and toto wolf was saying that the teams had been pressing the fia to restart races more sharply basically because there's been too many occasions where the safety car stayed out for one or two laps too long and unnecessarily and i think in this instance there was some kind of miscommunication that uh race control got the nod that the track was clear but clearly it wasn't or perhaps that it was clear and then somebody else said oh no you need to go out onto the track and pick that up or well the marshal did have some debris in his hand didn't he so maybe you know i'm all for getting the, the track clear and green flag racing as quickly as possible but also you do have to do the job properly and, and clear it so they'll, they'll be it's the usual thing it'll be lessons learned when it as it always is in these cases but boring as that is that there, there are lessons always to be learned from well these they, things. they have to learn from it because you know you pointed out the the incident in in 2011 in in canada you know you look at that video and your first 
instinct is is to laugh and i guess in some ways you kind of have to laugh when you see it because it it's actually unthinkable that a sport that operates with that sort of fluidity you know everything is just everything's spot on in 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 formula one everything's so pristine it runs like clockwork and for something like that to happen because at some point there there has been a breakdown in communication so all that needs to happen now is work out how that actually managed to happen and ensure it doesn't happen again because while there are freak circumstances that you know combine and then they, they result in something like this happening you know as you pointed out this isn't the first time we've seen it and there have been too many incidents in motorsport in, in recent years where freak accidents have happened and they they cost people their lives whether they're drivers or or, or support staff and that is unacceptable in in 2016 well tragically canadian grand prix did lose a marshal a few years ago to what was described as a freak accident but then again you read the accident report and you see the practices that were being used you know you do it enough times eventually something goes wrong so yeah you know you need to look after your marshals they have a reasonable expectation if they're told to go onto the track that cars will not be coming past at racing speed so uh an escape there but one they certainly need to look at obviously we also had an interesting uh, battle for some of the lower points kevin magnuson was probably the one that stood out see he benefited from some of the early problems but early in the race looking at the timing screens you're thinking yeah, if he if he absolutely aces this and things fall for him there, there could be points there in in the end the gap he had over perennial 11th place man esteban gutierrez was was quite comfortable but i thought that was a really really good drive from magnuson a driver who tends to veer from these really really outstanding drives to slightly less convincing weekends yeah he absolutely delivered this weekend and i remember him saying around the time of the summer break that his season was characterized by mistakes and miracles and you could say that his seventh place finish in the russian grand prix in may the last time Renault scored points before singapore was a miracle no one could really understand how a car that basically is in the the group of the worst three on the grid could suddenly end up running ahead of Force Indias and Haas and the like. But he did a great job that weekend and Singapore was similar. He found himself in a good position after first lap shenanigans. But from that moment on, he absolutely executed the race to perfection. Time management was superb. He credited the team's strategy for putting him on the super soft uh, all the way to the end rather than trying to take the soft tyre, which is what most teams opted to do who were on the two stop as the kind of master stroke that made it, but he had to execute that strategy and he did it brilliantly. To finish within nine seconds of a Force India and a Toro Rosso on that track in the Renault, which we know has not been a, a very well performing car at all this season, it was quite outstanding, I thought. And especially as, you know, the two guys that finished behind him on the road, Gutierrez and Massa, you know, they both had their opportunities to to beat Magnussen to that final point, but they just didn't they didn't pull it together. You know, how many times have we seen perennially 11th place man Gutierrez show flashes of genuine quality and I guess this was maybe the closest we've seen to him sort of piecing together a weekend but it still didn't quite have that last little bit needed you, you can actually argue with Esteban looking over his Grand Prix career there have only been a few weekends where he's really strong all together the Japanese Grand Prix a few years ago with Sauber when he when he got in the points was one one such example but there's so many times when you think at a given point in a weekend yeah he's, he's really bringing it together but then just ships a few too many seconds battling with people that he doesn't need to you know it's all about knowing who you're actually racing etc it's all right showing a little bit of fight but you, you just sort of feel there's a you know there's a, there's a very good driver in there but needs to string it together yeah he lost around 10 seconds I think I calculated from just unnecessarily fighting with Perez uh, with whoever basically on track he didn't and drivers he wasn't really competing with drivers well even drivers that he was competing with it was it, the time loss was more important than the track position at that stage and that really let him down I think because he has been improving and his qualifying performance in Monza he was ahead of Grosjean here he had a much cleaner weekend than Grosjean again qualified ahead of him Gutierrez is driving well and all season has had moments where he's driven very well but that's the problem really it's moments it's Mm. not the consistent through the weekend performance that you need and at this sort of time of year when you know the drivers are battling over the last remaining seats available on the grid for next year you need to have the kind of performances that Magnussen had in Singapore you need to show that you can deliver extraordinary results and extraordinary performances when it counts. You'd have to say that Kevin Magnussen is making a a good case to Renault at the moment to stay on obviously he was looking quite dicey in terms of remaining there next year but 
with the options available to them, he's certainly putting himself in the frame to to, to keep going. So what do we what do we think of Kevin Magnussen? Yeah, I think when Magnussen is in the car, there's absolutely no question that he can he can get the job done in the right equipment with the right setup with the right instructions the right plan. The questions are when things aren't quite right, does he have the wherewithal to work out what needs to be done? Does he have the force of character, the intelligence, the personality to bring the team together to to make the car better, to make the whole operation slicker? That's what the great drivers do. That's what the top drivers do. That's what the teams want from the drivers. And you get the impression with Renault, okay, the two drivers are young. One of them's basically a rookie. The other's a sophomore driver. You think, Maybe that's an unfair expectation, but you want to see those qualities. You could argue neither of them have really shown that, and that's why Renault is really in the market for other drivers with a bit more experience and maybe a bit more wherewithal to bring to the team. But if there is a seat there, and it looks the way the market's going, like there could be at least one seat available for one of the two incumbents, you'd have to give it to Magnussen at the moment because he has shown those peaks of performance that Jolian Palmer as improved as he's been in his first season, just hasn't been quite able to reach. The other thing with uh, with Magnussen as well, you know, butchering a something of an old saying in, in motorsport, I guess where he's concerned, it's probably easier to motivate a fast driver out of the car than it is to make a motivated driver out of the car fast in the car. You know, at least he, as you say, he might have weekends where he goes missing or he might not demonstrate all of the, you know, all of the capabilities that you really want from your lead driver. But he is still young. You know, he is ultimately still someone who could have you know quite a long career in in formula one it's very easy to forget that next year when stoffel van Dorn comes in you know this is van Dorn was a rookie at the time but you know magnuson's the guy who beat him in formula Renault 3.5 he might not he might not have been the most outstanding mclaren jr when they were together on that program but we are talking about magnuson compared to to van Dorn. he's very much for you know think how highly rated he was when you know when he joined mclaren he's he is a guy that you would look at if he was on the grid next year and say he's absolutely there on merit. Yeah, Magnussen is a is a very good driver. And it's also worth remembering that the Renault is, has been a poor car this year and it's very difficult for drivers to stand out when they're in poor cars. And it's very difficult for drivers who haven't got much experience in Formula 1 to, to improve those poor cars. Magnussen in his season at McLaren in 2014, he was quicker than Jensen Button. And we know that Jensen Button isn't maybe the quickest driver in the world, but he is a world champion, multiple Grand Prix winner, multiple pole position winner. So to beat quicker than that driver over the course of a season on pure pace in your first season in Formula 1 is is no mean feat. And that's worth that's worth something to a team, I think. Oh, definitely. It's all about showing what you can do and then just showing there's that learning curve and that improvement. That'll probably be the thing that will really... Well, two factors will decide whether Kevin Magnussen stays on, and that'll be partly what else happens in the driver market because there's still various drivers Renault are interested in, and also the learning curve he's showing the progression along along it within the team. Because I think they'd feel that if they can get the most out of him and he can feedback everything in he needs to, then that they have got a driver who can who can, as he showed in in Singapore, do a very good job. Yeah, and there was every chance that he could have stayed on at McLaren if commercial considerations had gone slightly differently, had Denmark invested in McLaren and gone out more out of its way to try and support him. He even thought he had the drive at one point, but McLaren board overturned the decision and decided to go with, with Button, who had done an outstanding job in 2014. But had Magnussen stayed on at McLaren, he'd performed well enough that he could have done. The only doubt was really his capacity maybe to, to really get on top of the tyres to really learn quickly what you want to see in Formula 1 is drivers take things on board once, move on, not repeat the same mistakes. That's not always happened in Magnussen's case. But if you look at the race that he executed in Singapore, you'd say there's tyre doubts that maybe McLaren had in 14. They certainly weren't evident in that race. So maybe he is getting there. The problem McLaren seemed to have is he kind of took one big step with the tyres and it's kind of right, That's your, you've got to the next level, but then you need to take the next two, three, four steps. And it seems to be kind of realising there's that kind of world beyond you need to keep always pushing into, which is what the, the guys like Alonso, Vettel are always doing. Yeah, Magnussen needed a bit too much help and advice, I think. And that was the the drawback. He couldn't always figure all of these tiny details out for himself. But in a world where radio communication has been relaxed again and the engineer can help the driver more, which has been the case more recently, that will help Magnussen if there is some kind of deficiency that remains there eight seconds uh, up the road from from Magnussen Daniel Kvyat I mean you know I know 
you know, the fact that he finished 40 seconds behind Verstappen shows just how ill-advised that fierce fight was in the first half of the race. But I think he deserves credit for scoring a couple of points, which obviously hasn't been, uh, you know, with, with what Toro Rosso has, has been in the last few races, hasn't really been possible. He did compromise his race doing what he did against Verstappen, but I don't think there were many F1 fans that saw that and didn't think, yeah, go on, well, well done for giving that a go, because that was very personal, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Kvyat's been driving quite well, actually, recently. It's just his form has improved at the exact point that the Toro Rosso has slipped back to being not really a points contender or, at Singapore, a marginal points contender, a particular track. I actually think, although it was nice to see him getting his elbows out, it was a bit short-sighted to to go after that personal vendetta with Verstappen in that race. Kvyat's race was with Alonso for seventh, and... At the time, there was a Toro Rosso radio communication saying, you know, if you can do this and go with the train, i.e. go with Alonso, then do it. But ultimately, that scrapping hurt his tyres. He dropped back and ended up finishing behind Perez. Really, he should have been mm. putting pressure on Alonso. So you'd have to say, OK, fair play, you raced for Stappen and proved that you're no pushover, but that car's far superior to yours. The bigger picture here is, can we score points for seventh rather than ninth? And from a team's point of view... That's an opportunity missed. I kind of have some sympathy for him wanting to show what he could do in battle with Verstappen, but yeah, certainly I'd agree. It's it was a you've got to be careful about giving away time in races. And in fact, he could easily have been ahead of Perez. And in fact, Magnussen that that final gap is slightly misleading because Magnussen was right with them, but I think he was backing off to attempt to let Rosberg lap him at the end. So you know, almost you had a, a race that could have been eighth place, almost became tenth place. So. You know, you need to be. He's kind of made his point. Let's put it that way. And now he just needs to, yeah, look at the big picture. He's shown he can, he can, he can hang on with Verstappen and say, yeah, I'm, I'm a serious driver. I still want to be here. But probably once is enough for for Daniel Kvyat in this case. Yeah, I don't know if uh, you know that is the thing that would save his career. Really, you would think if he'd have been able to beat Alonso to seventh place in that race, that's probably would have gone much further towards that that end than whether he can defend against Max Verstappen when they're not really racing each other. I'm all for showing what you can do, but you need to pick your battles and they need to mean something. You know, if Verstappen is racing him for position, then, you know, it's all bets are off. But when it's that stage of the race and you know you're not going to be able to race this car, and but you compromise your own race by doing so, it seems a bit short-sighted to me. Unless he obviously thinks he's out anyway at the end of the year and it's personal pride at stake. I don't th- think it's obviously uh, very easy to say that... a you know, someone who's very professional and at, at, at that level and racing for people who have paid for his motorsport for so long, you know, yeah, you do, you do owe them the, the professionalism that comes with being sensible, doing the best result for the team. But if in his head, in any way, he's sort of thinking my future lies outside of this team, you know, as we've all, well, I think we're all in agreement that he, uh, you can see why he did it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if his future is outside that team, though. That's the thing. I mean, you know, the kind of contract you end up on as a Red Bull junior means that your future isn't really your own to decide. So I think from Kvyat's point of view, what he has to do is is show Red Bull that he's still worth investing in. They've been, I think, very unusually patient with him, given how he's performed since losing his Red Bull drive to Verstappen. Okay, that is a huge blow to anyone, but he hasn't reacted very well, hasn't really got himself together. He started to show signs of it more recently, but you know his future, immediate future anyway, is with Red Bull and Toro Rosso, unless they release him from his contract. So he needs to prove to them that he's worth the bother before he can really worry about what anyone else thinks. So, well, looking back to the front, we've now just got six races to go. Rosberg leading the championship by eight points, so poised for a dramatic end to the season. Uh, check autosport.com for all the latest F1 news as well as the latest from the whole world of motorsport. And for more on the Singapore Grand Prix, check out the latest issue of Autosport magazine out Thursday. So thanks for joining us. Thanks to Ben Anderson and to Scott Mitchell. We'll be back next week with another Autosport podcast. <laughs>